let us continue with your uh, with our discussion of uh, projective varieties all right. So, what we will do is recall from the previous lecture that uh, uh, we, are, we are taking k to be an algebraically closed field. So, we always uh, uh, at least uh, when I define the projective space I do not need this. Uh, and in principle uh, according to uh, general the most general version of algebraic geometry which is scheme theory uh, in fact for defining projective space uh, k uh, need not even be a field it can even be a ring but then let us not go we are not working in that generality but we assume that at least uh, we are working with fields and since we are going to do geometry uh, we are working with algebraic closed fields okay. Uh, so at least for the initial part uh, k just need be a field it need not even be algebraically closed. So you know we have projective n space this is projective n space n space over k okay and uh, what is this this is uh, it is a quotient of uh, it is a quotient of uh, uh, the affine space, the affine n plus one space, uh, modulo uh, an equivalence, and what is the equivalence? Uh, the equivalence is you identify points on a on a line. Of course, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to. I want really uh, non-zero points, so I throw out the origin, and then I go modulo an equivalence relation. Okay, and what is this equivalence relation? This is the equivalence relation that identifies two points if they lie on the same line uh, passing through the origin. In other words, this is just the space of lines in uh, K n plus one. Okay, and uh, so you have uh, you have a natural map uh, K n plus one. Uh, to uh, p n k n plus one minus zero. This is the punctured uh, affine space to projective space. There is a natural map, which is the quotient map. Okay, uh, you can think of so uh, you you can think of every point being sent to its equivalence class, and the equivalence class can be thought of as a line. Okay, so you send a point with coordinates lambda not lambda n to uh, the line passing through to its equivalence class which is the line passing through lambda not etc lambda n and the origin okay this is the same as the equivalence class of that point lambda not etc lambda n where the square bracket uh, denotes equivalence class and this is also the same it is also written in this form it is written as lambda not semi uh, colon dot 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 lambda n where this colon is to be thought of as a ratio and uh, we put square brackets to say that uh, uh, this is a uh, this is a this is a set of n plus 1 scalars uh, which have this given ratio okay. So, so in other words what it means that is that you know if I multiply uh, if I multiply this by any non-zero element of k okay which means I multiply each entry by a uh, non-zero the same non-zero element of k then the line will not change all right and the equivalence class will not change okay uh, and this also will not change namely uh, there will be the same scalar multiplied through each of these entries and the rule is that the, the idea is that whenever you have this uh, whenever you have this colon you can cancel off the a common factor. So this is the same as t lambda 0 t lambda n for every t not equal to 0 in uh, in the field okay. So that is because if you take t lambda 0 to 3 to, to through t lambda n that also lies on the same line joining lambda 0 lambda n through the origin it defines the same line so it is the same equivalence class and it is the same point 
but the idea here is that whenever you have a uh, uh, whenever you have a ratio uh, whenever you write a ratio as a is to b you also write it as t a is to t b so you uh, so the ratio a is to b is the same as the ratio t a is to t b okay and you can cancel the t off from the t from the ratio t a is to t b to think of it as the ratio a is to b that was for th this is for uh, for the case of two a ratio of two numbers but then this is a ratio of uh, n plus 1 numbers okay and that's the meaning uh, i mean that's the reason for this notation these are called homogeneous coordinates okay they are called homogeneous coordinates because you can cancel out a common uh, you can cancel out a common divisor all right uh, so well i have now uh, now the, the the point is that uh, we would like to do geometry on the space so first of all you know uh, the the starting point is always to first make it in a topological space and there are two ways to do it okay so i'll tell you one way uh, uh, the one uh, one way is of course uh, uh, use the notion of quotient topology uh, which comes from the uh, from topology itself that's because the space above is actually the affine space affine n plus 1 space uh, uh, which is punctured at the origin okay and this is a zariski topology okay so this is a topological space and this is a surjective map from a topological space onto another set okay and then you can make this into a topological space by giving this what is called the quotient topology for this map okay what is that quotient topology it is the the open sets here are precisely those for which the inverse uh, image uh, under this map are open sets here okay and similarly for closed sets okay so uh, so what we do is that uh, pn uh, uh, can be made into a topological space in two ways number one uh, use the Zariski topology on uh, uh, a n plus 1 minus the origin okay a, a n plus 1 minus the origin which is the punctured affine n plus 1 space uh, uh, is an open subset of the affine n plus 1 space and any subset of a topological space automatically gets a induced topology okay so this has an induced topology from the bigger space which is the whole affine space okay and uh, so this ha has that topology and you can use the zariski topology uh, to uh, give uh, uh, the projective space the quotient topology topology via the map uh, pi you think of pi as a quotient map because it is quotient by an equivalence relation the after all what is projective space is the space of lines what are the lines they are the equivalence classes under this equivalence relation so this is a set of equivalence classes and you always call a map that goes from a set to uh, a set of equivalence classes a quotient map and you call this set of equivalence classes as the set of uh, you, you call this the uh, you call the quotient of the you call this the quotient of the given set by the given equivalence relation so this this affine space here is being th th this projective space is here being thought of as the punctured affine space uh, modulo going mod this equivalence okay and going modulo this equivalence is geometrically the same as looking at lines okay and every equivalence class here is a line here passing through the origin okay so of course when i say space of lines in k n plus 1 i should say through the origin that's important if i simply say space of all lines that's not correct I meant space of lines in n plus one affine space through the origin, all right? And uh, okay, so uh, so this is a standard thing in topology. Whenever you have a topological space and you have an equivalence relation on that, then you can go to the set of equivalence classes. There is a natural surjective map which associates to every point uh, its equivalence class, and then you can always give the quotient, the set of equivalence classes, yet quotient topology using that map. Okay, and we can follow that. Uh, 
uh, and what is that? That is a, a subset uh, uh, W in P n is open uh, respectively close if and only if pi inverse of W is open respectively closed in the space above because in the space above which is a punctured affine space you know what close or open means okay open means it is a complement of a closed set uh, and a closed set means it is uh, an algebraic set. So uh, an, uh, a closed set here is an algebraic set in the affine n plus 1 space with the origin removed okay that is what that is what closed sets here are right for the induced topology. So this is one way uh, you can give this to quotient topology and you see in this quotient topology uh, al uh, al always in uh, in the definition of the quotient topology uh, automatically it is a it ensures that uh, the quotient map becomes continuous because you are saying that a set here is open if and only if the inverse image is open. So automatically a set is if a set is open then its inverse image becomes open and that is the condition for verifying the continuity of a map. Okay, so when you give the quotient topology, automatically the map becomes continuous. Okay, the what is the other way of doing things? The other way of doing things is you try to indigenously define the uh, Zariski topology on the projective space. Okay, and uh, uh, and how do you do that? You imitate what you did for the affine space. Okay, for the affine space, how did we define? the Zariski topology we define the Zariski topology by defining closed sets and what were closed sets they were sets of common zeros of a bunch of polynomials in the right number of variables. Now what you do is you uh, you just adapt the same definition okay but now you say that you look at common zeros of a bunch of polynomials uh, but not just any polynomials but polynomials are homogeneous okay because uh, uh, if a polynomial is not homogeneous then it is not that it does not guarantee that if it vanishes at one point of a line uh, it will vanish at other points of the line passing through the origin okay. So, uh, so, so you know uh, so you know uh, what I am trying to say is that when we defined uh, uh, for example uh, a closed set in a n or a n plus 1 of course this is sitting inside a n okay I mean a n plus 1 and how did we define a closed set here a closed set here was well we took a polynomial in n plus 1 variables all right and then uh, not one of one not one polynomial but several polynomials a collection of polynomials and look at the common zeros and define such ses sets to be closed sets here okay but the problem is that if you take a polynomial okay uh, in n plus 1 variables trying to say that it vanishes at a point here is a little tricky which means effectively you are trying to say it is it's a pol you must think of it as a polynomial okay which uh, vanishes on a a point here corresponds to a line here a line in the fine n plus 1 space passing through the origin you want a polynomial to vanish on a line okay. Now uh, that would not happen unless the polynomial is homogeneous okay. So uh, uh, at least uh, uh, I should say that at least if the polynomial is homogeneous you have hope of uh, the property that if it vanishes at, at a point uh, on a line passing through the origin then it will vanish on the entire line passing through the origin okay. So that is the reason that when you define the Zariski topology on projective end space you uh, look at homogeneous polynomials and uh, you imitate the definition of Zariski topology on affine space while in affine space a close uh, the closed sets are given by common zero loci of a bunch of polynomials in projective space the uh, uh, the closed sets are uh, or the algebraic sets are given by common zero loci of bunch of homogeneous polynomials okay. So, uh, so here is the second definition uh, define uh, the uh, the Zariski topology on uh, P n to be uh, to be the one for which uh, 
uh, the closed sets are given as uh, the common zero common zeros of a collection a subset of homogeneous polynomials uh, in uh, the in all the you know uh, functions on the uh, affine space above uh, which is just identified with k x x not through x okay so uh, so you can define another topology on the projective space this is a zeroc topology on the projective space which imitates uh, it's also given by common zero loci of uh, a bunch of polynomials but this case but in this case uh, we consider only homogeneous polynomials okay and mind you homogeneous polynomial means that uh, in the variables if you multiply each of the variables by t then uh, <coughs> that is if you substitute for each variable a constant multiple of that variable okay the same constant multiple then that constant comes out with the power uh, it can be factored out okay and that power that comes out is called the degree of homogeneity of the polynomial okay. So uh, the fact is that uh, uh, actually uh, I think it is a good point to tell you one more thing uh, there is in fact one more way of getting the topology on Pn okay. So I will tell you what that one more way there is yet another way okay. So there is yet another way of getting the topology on uh, projective space okay uh, and of course you know what I am trying to tell you I am going to I am just going to tell you that you know uh, you define there are three ways of defining the topology on projective space and they are all the same okay they are all going to give you they are all going to give you the same result all right so what is this yet another way this is this is the standard uh, way uh, uh, in which you think of a projective space as being gotten by gluing n plus 1 copies of affine space okay. So you see I, I will tell you uh, well let me put it as 3 in continuation with this uh, 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 via the gluing of n plus 1 copies of a n now so I have to explain what this means so what we will do is let me do the following thing so you you take you take uh, projective space okay take projective space and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the points in the projective space are given are written in terms of homogeneous coordinates like this okay and then what we will do is let us look at uh, for each uh, for each of the chord uh, uh, and for, for each fixed position look at all those uh, coordinates okay for which uh, that particular coordinate does not vanish okay. So what I mean is uh, you define ui to be the set of all points with homogeneous coordinates lambda naught through lambda n such that lambda i is not 0 you define ui like this okay this is for 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 i equal to 0 1 etc up to n okay you define these sets all right and uh, well you know uh, you must guess that uh, these sets are going to be open sets because you know they look like uh, for example u0 is first quad first homogeneous coordinate one not vanishing okay u1 is second co homogeneous coordinate not vanishing ui is the ith homogeneous coordinate not vanishing and whenever a coordinate does not vanish that should be an open set okay. So you must ima you, you can see that these are going to be the open sets okay but then let us let us not worry about uh, them as open sets you know uh, uh, well in fact I can say I can say that 
you know if you take the inverse image of this u i okay uh, uh, under this uh, under this map uh, then I am going to get uh, uh, the complement of the 0 set of x i the i th coordinate uh, 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 the uh, in fact I should call it i plus 1th coordinate because I am starting with 0 uh, my numbering starts with 0. So you know uh, if I take this u i and take the inverse image above what I will get is I will get all the points with uh, the i plus 1th coordinate not 0 okay and that is the I will get that set inside uh, the uh, puncture affine space and you know its complement will be all those points with i plus 1th coordinate uh, I mean with the with that coordinate 0 which is of course a closed set okay. So the inverse image of ui under uh, under pi is certainly an open set and therefore you know this is certainly open according to the definition of the quotient topology okay I mean uh, uh, according to the definition of the quotient topology it is also open according to the definition of the of this indigenous Zariski topology because it is actually the complement of the 0 locus of that coordinate where that coordinate is considered as a homogeneous polynomial of degree 1 okay see so note that note that uh, uh, pi inverse of u i uh, is actually uh, z uh, it is a n plus 1 k minus z of uh, x i intersection with a n plus 1 k minus <coughs> the origin okay this is what it is this is actually what this is just t x i is this so uh, the complement of uh, the 0 set of xi is the basic open set defined by xi all right and that is an open set and if you intersect it with uh, this subset it will give you an open subset of this okay. So this is uh, which is open which is open in uh, uh, the, uh, the punctured affine space above of which the projective space is a quotient okay. So you know according to definition 1 this is an open subset of the projective space if you give it the if you look at the quotient topology then this is certainly an open set okay and uh, what you must understand is that uh, you see uh, uh, all these ui's i equal to 0 to n there are n plus 1 of them and they cover the projective space because when you write a point with projective homogeneous coordinates all coordinates cannot be 0 because you have, you have thrown out this is the image of a point on the punctured affine space above okay. So you are not uh, so all the coordinates cannot be 0 right so whenever you write homogeneous coordinates at least one coordinate is not 0 which tells you that therefore that point lies in one of the ui's. So all the ui's these n plus 1 ui's they are a cover for the projective space okay and uh, uh, according to this definition uh, uh, if you give the map pi the quotient topology then these ui's are open okay according to this definition also it is open because you see uh, uh, note note also that uh, 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 if you take away uh, ui from tn what you will get is of course uh, the 0 set in tn of the homogeneous polynomial xi see you take the polynomial xi okay that is of course homogeneous polynomial it is homogeneous of degree 1 all right. So by definition it is 0 set is should define a uh, uh, closed subset of projective space and therefore its complement uh, which is precisely ui is open okay. So this ui is open according to this definition it is also open according to this definition all right. Now uh, further all the ui's uh, union of all the ui's i equal to 0 to n is actually pn of course the projective space is covered by these by these sets okay but the third the third topology 
on Pn is something that I have not yet defined. So, so, but I but I need these uis to define it. So what I'm going to do is now you take this ui, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, which is the set of all uh, homogeneous coordinates points in uh, Pn such that uh, the ith coordinate is not zero, uh, which is subset of uh, Pn. And what you do is you define a map like this into an. Okay, the the point is that each ui is automatically a an an affine n space. Each ui is actually an affine n space. Okay, and beautiful thing is its complement, which is uh, zxi, is a projective space of dimension one less. Okay, so the the beautiful thing is that each of these uis is actually an an okay and its complement is a pn minus 1 all right so so let me explain that and 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 that complement pn minus 1 is called the hyperplane at infinity okay so uh, so let me explain that so you know this map is very easily defined so what you do is you take a point with coordinates lambda not etc so i will write this down there is a lambda i minus 1 there is a lambda i uh, and then there is a well there is a lambda i plus 1 uh, I will not write lambda i plus 1 because it might be the last then lambda n okay and you know what I am going to do see I know lambda i is not 0 alright and you know the homogeneous coordinate is not going to be uh, affected if uh, you know I multiply the whole set of homogeneous coordinates by non zero number and what I am going to do is I am going to just multiply it by uh, uh, 1 by lambda i which makes sense because lambda is not 0 alright and then that will give me a 1 in the ith position okay uh, 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 on the in the in the place of lambda i will get a 1. So what you must understand is that this is the same as well let me write this it is lambda or not by lambda i lambda 1 by lambda i blah 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 here I will get lambda i minus 1 by lambda i then I will get a 1 and so on I will get a lambda n by lambda i these two ratios are these two are one and the same point on projective space that is because this is just this multiplied by uh, this uh, the same lambda i which is a non zero uh, element of k okay and uh, uh, but then you see this point 1 is uh, I mean this 1 is redundant so what you do is you send you get only uh, the remaining n uh, distinct uh, scalars and these are the n scalars to which uh, I mean these are the coordinates to this is the these define the coordinates of the point to which you are going to send it. So what you are going to do is you are going to just send it to lambda naught by lambda i comma lambda 1 by lambda i and lambda n by lambda i where you know the way I have written it is you omit you omit lambda i by lambda i which is 1 okay. So this is this is n plus 1 uh, entries I omit that one and I get n entries okay. Now uh, because uh, because of the way I have defined it you can check that this is a bijective map this is a bijective map uh, that is the reason is because you know the moment one of the coordinates becomes one you see uh, then uh, then the other coordinates are unique for that uh, given line because if you try to change by a scalar okay then uh, uh, this uh, you cannot change it by a scalar without changing the one to something else okay. So if you freeze the ith coordinate as one then the remaining uh, then for each line for which the ith coordinate is not zero okay if you feel if you if you uh, rationalize so that the ith coordinate becomes 1 for a representative point on the line then the remaining n coordinates are unique. So the fact is that this is a bijective map so I know let me call this as phi i phi i is a bijection this phi i is a bijection and uh, 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 of course you know it is a bijection why is it surjective well uh, phi i uh, is injective 
it is injective and subjective for the reasons I just said but anyway let me if you, if you want you can write it out it is not a big deal uh, you know if uh, if you have if phi i of one point a uh, given point lambda naught through lambda n uh, is equal to phi i of another point mu naught through mu n then so this will imply that uh, lambda naught by lambda i etc lambda n by lambda i is the same as mu naught by mu i by mu i and so on mu n by mu i okay and uh, uh, what this will tell you is that it will just tell you that lambda not uh, uh, so it will tell you that lambda not is lambda uh, i by mu i into mu not uh, so each lambda j is lambda i by mu i into mu j and this lambda i by mu i is one and the same uh, it is fixed i is fixed okay lambda i is fixed mu i is fixed okay therefore this quotient is a uh, is a fixed scalar and what you are saying is that every lambda is a fixed scalar times every mu the corresponding mu and that means that these two points define one in the same line that means they are one in the same point on projective space. So this implies that the these two points are the same. Okay, this is just injectivity. I mean, uh, and and of course, surjectivity is very very simple again. Why is that? So, uh, you give me a point in affine space, a point. Uh, uh, well, uh, x one, etc., x n in a n is phi of well I can write this point you know what I am just going to put uh, uh, yeah I put x1 etc and then I put a 1 in the ith position and then I put uh, of course I put semi I have to put colons here because this is a this is just a homogeneous coordinates. So if I take this point this point will go to uh, the point I started with. So it is surjective. So if you want a map from here to here you simply write these coordinates uh, in the same order as n plus 1 entries homogeneous coordinates but put uh, do not fill the ith position in the ith position you put 1 the remaining n positions you put these in the same order that is the that is the map in the reverse direction therefore you know these phi i's are all uh, bijective maps the phi i's are all bijective maps and uh, uh, the fact is that now what I can do I can do the following thing uh, so you know in very much the same way in which you get a manifold by getting uh, local charts into Euclidean space you think of uh, trying to make projective space uh, uh, you know uh, uh, in a sense like a manifold uh, by taking these as local charts which identify these uh, essentially open sets with affine spaces. So you have so you think of uh, so in other words I am saying that you know I am saying use these phi i's which are bijective maps to transport the topology on the affine space back to ui see each affine each copy of affine space has a topology it is a Zariski topology. So I can uh, simply transfer the topology here namely what is it you give me a subset the uh, here the subset here is open or respectively closed if and only if its image here is open respectively closed for the Zariski topology on this affine space okay. So with that definition also I can give you a topology on each ui okay and the ui's cover uh, the u is of course cover the affine space and uh, the only thing that you will have to worry about is whenever there is an intersection the topologies agree okay. So uh, that will happen okay that is analogous to uh, the, com the compatibility of charts 
which involves the transition functions being good okay and uh, in, in this case the transition functions will be just x i by x j okay uh, and therefore uh, what will happen is that you will get a good all these topo all these topologies on each u i which are transported via the phi i. So each of these topological spaces u i they will glue well on the intersections u i intersection u j to give a unique topology on p n okay and that is yet another topology on the projective space okay which comes from. Uh, uh, which comes via the gluing of n plus 1 copies of affine space these n plus 1 copies of affine space are given by the uis which have been identified with the corresponding affine spaces via phi is okay. So uh, so there are and the, and, the, and, the, and the big deal is that uh, the big deal here is that uh, you know uh, that all these topologies agree on the intersections okay that is a very important thing. So you know if you have a topological space okay and suppose you have two uh, if you have a sub if you have just have a set okay and if you have two subsets and suppose on each subset I give you a topology alright then on the union of those two subsets this will give a topology provided on the intersection the topologies should agree okay the intersection uh, uh, a set in the intersection uh, considered as a subset of one is open if and only if it is open with respect to uh, when it is considered as a subset of the other okay. So you know if you have two sets two subsets of a space uh, of a set you give them topologies separately okay then when do you get a topology on the union you will get a topology on the union only when on the intersection the topologies agree that is a subset of the intersection is open respectively closed in one if and only if it is in the other okay this is the situation for two sets. But if you have a collection of sets <laughs> for example even a collection of subsets which is a cover for the given sets on each subset if you give me a topology when will all these subsets glue together to give a global topology on the set that requires a compatibility okay it requires a compatibility that whenever you take a certain sub collection of subsets and you take their intersection a subset of that is open if and only or closed if and only if it is so in each. Uh, topology coming from uh, the corresponding members okay. So and the fact is that is a big fact the fact is that uh, all these topologies on each ui okay which come uh, from the topo Tarski topologies of on affine space they all glue together and give you a topology on the projective space this is the third way of getting a topology on the projective space and the fact is all the three are one and the same okay. So there are three ways of giving a topology on projective space and they are all the same. Now uh, what I am going to do is uh, 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 so let me write that down uh, so maybe I will write it here uh, so I will write here uh, give each ui a topology by declaring phi i to be a homeomorphism that is that is a subset w in ui is open respectively closed if and only if P W P I W in A M is open respectively closed. Okay. So if you give this topology to U I uh, via phi I, then it becomes it's automatic that uh, uh, this phi I becomes a homeomorphism of U I to uh, a fine space. Okay. So you know. What you're doing is for every point on this UI, you're giving me a uh, you're 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 just taking n affine coordinates. Okay, you're so each one is a coordinate map. Each one should be thought of as a chart, the analog of a chart for a manifold. Okay, so each one is a coordinate map. All right, and what we are saying is that uh, once you once you have a manifold structure, uh, each uh, 
uh, each chart in the atlas if you take the corresponding coordinate map it is of course a, 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 a good function uh, it is a, it is of course an isomorphism okay so in this case uh, what is happening is we are gluing topological spaces all the uis are glued together to give the topology on pm so uh, the the topologies on uh, on each ui agree or uh, are compatible on the intersections and define a topology on uh, pn and for that topology on pn when do you say a subset of projective space is uh, open or closed uh, it is open or closed if and only if its intersection with each ui is correspondingly uh, open or closed in that ui and how do you check it you check it by taking its image under phi i and see whether the set you get in the corresponding affine space is open or closed okay so uh, so this has to be checked that you have to check that the topologies on uh, each ui uh, they are all compatible all right so for you know for example if i take uh, two different uis ui and uj it should not happen that a subset of ui intersection uj is an open subset of ui and is a not an open subset of uj such a thing should not happen it won't happen that is the compatibility you have to check okay so uh, uh, in other words ui intersection uj has a topological subspace structure from ui it also has a topological subspace structure from uj and my claim is that these two are the same okay that is what has to be checked right it is only if you check that then you are saying that these topologies glue together to give a global topology on the ambient space which is the uh, full projective space okay and what is a big deal the big deal is uh, whether you use one two or three the topology you get on projective space is one and the same and that is the that is the Zariski topology on projective space okay so uh, so let me write that down in fact uh, so here is a fact it needs a little bit of checking that it is pretty easy to do you can try it out fact uh, <coughs> or theorem if you want uh, or each of these ways each of these three topologies on p n is the same as the others that is a fact okay. So, uh, so the uh, so what you must understand is that all these phi i's are actually homeomorphisms. So, if you think of uh, projective space with the Zariski topology if you think of this as an open subset and you take the induced topology then each phi i is automatically a homeomorphism okay by this fact by this theorem alright. Now, uh, uh, so this is something that uh, I leave it to you to check but probably portions of it we will check as we go ahead. Uh, now what I what I want to do is uh, I want to you know the purpose of uh, uh, of course uh, uh, this course is to translate from geometry to algebra and back okay. So the all this that we have been saying is more or less uh, completely geometric and topological but then to go to the commutative algebra side uh, we will have to worry about uh, the the polynomials that are involved okay and you know that that is where the second definition comes in the second definition which says that the Zariski topology on projective space is given by close by taking the closed sets to be common 0 loci of a bunch of homogeneous polynomials in the right number of variables the number of variables will be one more than the uh, uh, than the subscript the superscript up, up appearing in the projective space okay. So we have to study these homogeneous polynomials so for the first question is why homogeneous polynomials and then uh, that will lead to looking at uh, the theory of homogeneous ideas ok. 
okay. So, uh, the fact is uh, when we did uh, uh, just like when we did uh, translation from, from the Tversky topology and affine space to the polynomial ring we were worried about ideals okay. We will uh, when we do study Zarsky topology on projective space you will also have to translate everything to ideals but the only thing is the ideals now will be so called homogeneous ideals okay and uh, one way of thinking of homogeneous ideals is that these are ideals which are generated by homogeneous polynomials okay. So uh, first of all I want you to realize uh, that uh, the homogeneity property uh, it can be defined in more than one way uh, and uh, uh, to explain that uh, let us look at an example okay. So uh, suppose uh, uh, you take a suppose uh, we take a point lambda not lambda n in projective space and let f x not through x n vanish on the line through lambda not etcetera lambda n which is actually this point okay. The point in projective space is the same as its inverse image which is the line okay. So you know uh, uh, well the the way I have written it is that when I say that this point uh, uh, on projective space corresponds to this line this line can also be thought of as living it is actually being thought of as living above. So actually you know this uh, the inverse image of this point is this line thought of as a line above okay. Here you are thinking of the line as a point here okay but if you think of it as a subset of a n plus 1 okay then the inverse image of this is this line itself okay. So you know pi inverse of this point is actually the line through uh, lambda not lambda n considered as a subset of a n plus 1 right that is what it is. So you know you get another nice picture of this uh, of this uh, of this whole uh, of this map you get the picture of what is called as a line bundle. A line bundle is something for which you have a you have a map from one topological space to another topological space for every point below the inverse image is a line above okay. So you think of this as a bundle of lines above this and what is uh, every line above goes to the corresponding point it represents in the projective space okay. So you think of this vibration as it is called as a uh, it is thought of as a uh, it's it's sort of as a line bundle. You think of given a point here, a point here corresponds to a line above, a line through the origin above. And what is that line through the origin above in terms of the point here? It is well, if you take the inverse image of this point, that's exactly that line above. Okay, that's what I've written here. All right. Now you see, uh, see if the if the polynomial vanishes on this line, okay, what it means is. So, so this, so this implies for every t, uh, uh, for every t <coughs> uh, which is a non-zero scalar, the field, okay. Uh, well, f of t uh, lambda not etc. t lambda n should be zero. This should happen, right? Because you see, I have told you that the. <coughs> uh, uh, so you know, if I draw a diagram, here is my projective space. Okay, and I have taken a point here uh, with with homogeneous coordinates lambda not through lambda n, and under this map pi, I go to the affine punctured affine space above. What I get is, well, I get the line uh, through lambda not uh, etc. Lambda n minus, of course, <coughs> the origin. So if I take pi, uh, this is what uh, so pi inverse gives me this <coughs> inverse image. Don't confuse pi inverse for inverse map. I get this line. Of course, I the the origin is thrown out because I'm considering it as a subset of the punctured plane. Then 
you see when I say the polynomial vanishes on this line it means that it should vanish at every point on that line and every point on that line looks like this okay. But then you write this out <coughs> you write this out what it will tell you is the following uh, yeah so I should here also when I say pi inverse of the point is this line uh, I should say uh, this line minus the origin uh, inside affine in inside the function affine space because pi is not defined at 0 all right so this is the right way to write it but you do not worry about uh, the, the point at 0 which has been intentionally removed okay. So <coughs> well so in any case now you see you write this polynomial f of x dot xn you break it down into its various homogeneous components you see a polynomial in n variables can be broken up into pieces a sum of pieces each of which is homogeneous of a particular degree. So there is a degree 1 term which will be linear expression in the x i's okay then there will be a degree 2 term which is a linear expression in product of 2 x i's namely it will involve x i squares and you will get x i x j okay and so on you will get so the polynomial breaks down into f not x not etc xn this is this is degree 0 so this is actually a constant this is a 0 this is this is the constant term of the polynomial which is which is what you will get when you put everything 0 okay plus I will get f of f1 which is degree 1 term this is degree 1 this is the linear term then and I will get it and I will go on like this and I will get f d which is the degree d term this is the degree d term and of course when d is 1 it is linear d is 2 it is quadratic d is 3 it is cubic and so on and so forth and so on you go on up to f to the degree n this is the highest degree of the polynomial okay it is a degree of the highest weight monomial that monomials that occur okay and the point is that each of these guys is homogeneous of a corresponding degree. So if you take f d this homogeneous of degree d f 1 is linear it is homogeneous of degree 1 all right and now you know let us let us look at this condition f of t lambda not through t lambda n is 0 for every t non 0. So what it will tell you is 0 is equal to f of t lambda not uh, t lambda n that will be that will tell you that you know when I plug this in I will get well uh, this will just remain f not <coughs> t lambda not <coughs> t lambda n plus when I plug t lambda not through t lambda n uh, here then t will come out because it is degree 1. <coughs> Similarly when I plug it in f d t power d will come out because it is homogeneous of degree d so the expression will like look like t times f of lambda not etc lambda n plus t squared f of lambda not etc lambda n and so on t to the d f of lambda not etc lambda n plus blah 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 you will get t power degree f times f of lambda not etc lambda n this is what you get you get for every t for every t not equal to 0 in the field okay you get this expression uh, sorry yeah I should put sorry you are right I should put f1 should put f2 fd this is f sub degree f yeah thanks these are not uh, they, they should not be f they are the corresponding homogeneous components thanks. <coughs> So this is t times f1 t squared time times f2 t power d times fd and so on okay. Now you know uh, I want to uh, uh, I claim that this implies that uh, you know uh, I claim that this implies that f each fd of uh, lambda naught etc lambda is 0 
uh, 0 for every d greater than or equal to 0. Okay. I claim that uh, each uh, f d uh, each f d vanishes and 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 so uh, f d of t lambda not etcetera t lambda in also vanishes for all t in uh, a scalar which is non zero <coughs> this is my claim okay you know see therefore uh, what I am trying to say is that if a polynomial vanishes on a line then each of its homogeneous components also vanishes on that line okay each of its homogeneous components also vanishes on that line okay that is what I am trying to say and uh, this is the key to defining uh, a homogeneous ideal alright and why is this true why this is true is because you know let let me call this as uh, let me call this scal scalar as a0 after all this is scalar uh, 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 of course here this is independent of t because this is the first term it is constant so let me call this so uh, what i'll get is i'll get a0 plus t a1 plus t squared a2 plus t power d a d and so on up to uh, plus uh, t power degree f a sub degree f is zero so i will get a polynomial in one variable okay with these coefficients k coefficients and what I am saying is that that polynomial identically vanishes on the affine line minus the origin okay but you know if a polynomial vanishes on an open set it vanishes everywhere okay if a polynomial is 0 on an open set it is 0 everywhere that is just because of continuity of the zero scooter function therefore uh, and of course mind you here you here is the first place where you are using k is algebraically closed because I want k to be an infinite field okay. So uh, uh, probably I do not um, okay I need k uh, an infinite field alright for that. So I am just saying the fact that you, you have polynomial in one variable you know if it vanishes uh, on an open set okay then it is identically uh, then, it, then it is identically the 0 polynomial. So therefore this polynomial is identically the 0 polynomial therefore every coefficient is 0 that is exactly what I have written here okay. So uh, the moral of the story is uh, I want you to remember is, the, is the, this is the key fact defining what a homogeneous ideal is. The fact is if a polynomial vanishes on a line then every each one of its homogeneous components that also vanishes on the line and in particular it is a non constant pol uh, uh, I mean the, the constant term is 0 in particular the constant term cannot be non zero the constant term has to be zero okay so uh, so this is the point i want you to remember when we go to the next lecture right so i'll stop here <laughs>